The following program is paid for by the ministry partners of the Hour of Power and viewers like you. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning. And welcome visitors and church family. We are still so sad not to be with you in person, but we are together in spirit. And I do believe that God is calling all of us to pray fervently. I have a friend who said, we need to be praying like the prophets. Elijah prayed fervently for God to stop the rain, and he did. God can turn this crisis into redemption and recovery. Your prayers matter. Your prayers change things. Amen. It's a good reminder to all of us. And of course, we're also taking all the important medical precautions. Even here in the church, I just want to say thank you to the choir and the orchestra mm -hmm. for being willing to come, even though with all of the space again and everything. I love the new uh, setup. It looks like a YouTube, like a music video or something, but uh, it looks great. So, you know, we're doing our best here to gather in the best way we can without, you know, spreading the virus and making sure that everybody at home can participate with us. So we're just so, so glad that you're joining us now. And if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, Maybe share the video or text a friend and let them know that they can join us right now in church coming to you live. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much that you love us and that you've called us. And I pray, God, that, that you would help us during this time of this virus to find the treasures within the obstacle, to find the opportunities that only make themselves available during these difficult times. I pray that your Holy Spirit would give us a, a fresh uh, vision for our lives, that when we do get back to work and we get back to our normal lives, we will, we will be bringing something with us that we didn't have, something wonderful, good, that we didn't have before this time. I pray for health and healing over everybody. And thank you, God. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Turn around to the person in your living room and say, God loves you and so do I. As a daily reminder of who you are in Christ, Pastor Bobby wants to send you this God Loves You cross. Fashioned in silver metal, this delicate cross is crowned with disc-shaped beads and below a gleaming glass crystal that reflects brilliant colors when touched by light. Hang it in a window or anywhere the sun shines and allow it to remind you of the radiance of Christ's promises. We've also included a suction cup so it can be easily secured to a window or other non-porous surface. We're asking for your generous gift of any size. For your gift of $100 or more, we'll include the black leather bound Hour of Power Bible and DIY Build Your Faith book. Filled with tips and habits to assist you in growing as a disciple of Jesus, the book is a perfect complement to the easy to understand NIV Bible. You have the power to build a faith that is more vibrant and powerful than you ever imagined. So call, write, or go online today and request these special resources. I invite you to come alive with me each and every day this year by investing in your walk with Jesus and making him known to others. There has never been a more critical time for people to know that God alone can fill the emptiness in their hearts. Together, we can share his love with the world. Thank you, and remember, as always, God loves you, and so do we.
Thank you, choir and orchestra. In preparation for the message, Luke 10, 33. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Church family, loving your enemies is the best way to show Jesus you trust him with your life. Amen.
it's moments like this that we are reminded that the church is not a building. The church is the people of God. As we look for new ways to communicate with one another and be in community with one another through phone and text, email and streaming online, we remember that we are the people of God gathered together in this place wherever you are. So would you join me in prayer this morning? Father, we come to you with heavy hearts as we look all over the world. Or we, we pray for those who are sick. We lift up our government officials. We pray for clarity of mind. We play, pray for avenues forward. Lord, we pray for answers. We pray for a flattening of the curve. And we remember all of those who are so susceptible to a virus like this. Yet, Lord, in the midst of this, we know that you are a God who is active and alive in our world. And so, Lord, we give you praise. We haven't lost our praise, as we just sang. We look to the good in some of these quarantine situations. Time spent with family. Time to connect with loved ones where maybe we didn't have a chance to before. The beauty of nature that surrounds us. So, Lord, give us eyes to see the good. Give us eyes to see where you are moving. And, Lord, help us be your church. Help us be your hands and your feet in this world in whatever way we can. Maybe it's a phone call. Maybe it's a text. And for all of us, it's prayer. Lord, remind us of the power of prayer, that prayer changes things. So, Lord, once again, we pray for the doctors, the scientists, the government officials. And, Lord, we pray for an end to this virus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
we find ourselves in this unprecedented time in history, during our lifetimes at least, we look around at our community and some are out of work. Those who are in the service industries, the arts, they're struggling. Others of us are doing okay. And so I'm asking right now, if, if you're one of those who's doing okay, would you consider giving a little bit more to keep this church going? We believe that the world more than ever needs the message of Jesus' hope, of the life-changing and transforming power of the Holy Spirit. You know, we believe that as a community, we are called not only to spread the message of the gospel to the world, but to look after one another. So would you consider giving today? Thank you. As the Father has sent me, even so I send you. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to the whole creation. Do you have children? Yes, I have two children and an adopted daughter. Wonderful. They're terrible children. What are you talking <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> you don't know them. Oh, I'm sorry. No, they really are. They're really great. <laughs> you can't break them. It's just terrible. Okay. <laughs> He's a great straight man. This is wonderful. Thank you for joining us on Hour of Power today. We hope you found incredible hope and inspiration from this program. This Easter season, Hannah and I want you to know that you have a family and we invite you to come home. God's message to you is that you are loved and you are chosen. He is your friend and you are the apple of his eye. Nothing you go through can separate you from his amazing love. That is right, Easter means victory. Jesus is victorious over death. When I reflect on the struggles I've faced in my past, I can see that God reigned triumphant in all of them. And when I look at my current challenges, I have faith that the victory is already won. Friends, whatever struggle you may be facing, God's arms are strong enough to carry it. The resurrection matters because Jesus is alive today and he's working in and through you. You have a divine destiny and your best days are ahead. To empower you in your walk with God, we've created special resources to help strengthen your bond with Jesus and equip you to share your faith with others. Call, write, or go online today and request the God Loves You Cross. Fashioned in silver metal, this delicate cross is crowned with disc-shaped beads, and below, a gleaming glass crystal reflects brilliant colors when touched by light. Hang it in a window or anywhere the sun shines and allow it to remind you of the radiance of Christ's promises. We've also included a suction cup so it can be easily secured to a window or other non-porous surface. We're asking for your generous gift of any size. For your gift of $100 or more, we'll include the black leather bound Hour of Power Bible and DIY Build Your Faith book filled with tips and habits to assist you in growing as a disciple of Jesus, the book is a perfect complement to the easy to understand NIV Bible. You have the power to build a faith that is more vibrant and powerful than you ever imagined. So call, write, or go online today and request these special resources. For 50 years, we've been planting seeds of God's love and inviting people of every age and background to know Jesus as their savior. Your financial support provides the foundation we need to continue reaching our friends all around the world. So thank you. Remember always, God loves you and so do we. Surrounds his saints, he will deliver.
Well, thank you so much for joining us wherever you are, wherever you are in your living room or in your car or on your cell phone. If you'd like to stand, please stand with me or stand with us. And we're going to say this creed together. Hold your hands out like this as a way of receiving from the Lord. Let's say this. I'm not what I do. I'm not what I have. I'm not what people say about me. I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it from me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with the world. Thanks. You can be seated. Well, uh, welcome again. We're so glad that you're here. And uh, how about the coronavirus, huh? You haven't, we haven't heard enough about that. Uh, you know, everybody's scared right now. Uh, there's this, who knew? You know, it's one of these black swans that this little tiny bug that nobody can see would shut down our economy, bringing it to a total halt. Lots of people are scared, in particular 1099 employees, people with small businesses. Nobody's going out anymore, and if they are, it's very short, and that's a good thing in terms of preventative, but it's a bad thing for the economy and for loneliness and for boredom. Man, Disneyland is still closed, and things like that, you know? And when people get scared, as many are, sometimes people do stupid things. 
like the guy who, with, who I said you better have IBS, who had a grocery cart full of toilet paper going back to his car. Uh, there are ex other examples. Uh, there was a lady, in, uh, uh, there was a guy who said that he was talking to a checkout lady from Whole Foods, and she said every time at her lunch, she just goes into her car and she just cries for half an hour because customers, so many customers have been mean to her. Or we also had the Florida incident, we don't need to get into that, but spring break, you know, with these kids all huddling together. So there are definitely outliers where people get mean. But can I say that I'm actually surprised because I feel that the majority of Americans, and I think the majority of people who, countries that are uh, struggling with this, are, are doing what is right and doing what is good. I actually believe that this is an opportunity where the best you know, the best of, of who we are as a people can come out in, in love of neighbor. When you're scared, it's, it's difficult to love your neighbor. When, when you've got that last bit of hand sanitizer or that last loaf of bread and you see someone that needs it and you give it to them, that is an act of kindness and bravery that I think is needed today. And I'm reading all sorts of great stories online of people loving their neighbor and doing selfless things. I know grocery stores have made a change to allow the elderly to come in first in the first hour that the store is open. I think that's wonderful. Uh, I remember reading a story where a checkout person from Costco said that, that there was an old lady in line and she had forgotten to grab bread or the bread was out and there was a, a kid behind her who had a loaf of bread and he, he gave her his loaf of bread and he said, if there's anything else, can I run back and grab it for you? People are just reaching out, you know? P people are sending texts and calling each other and comforting one another and praying for each other. We even had lots of pastors and friends and family text us or call us this week. You know, even, even we pastors who are supposed to do the ministry are being ministered to. We had good family friends of ours who sent us purple roses and flowers because I had purple lavender behind me and, and now our house is full of flowers and full of this great fragrance. And, the strange thing is that we get, when we get into these moments of shutdown, sometimes we actually remember what is most important. And what is most important is our friends and our family and our life with God. And those things don't need to change. Yes, we have these boundaries and these barriers and these things that make us difficult. It's almost like a wartime situation, but yet we're still able in these times to recognize how much we need each other. Sometimes the space actually creates more intimacy and compassion and, and a longing to be with one another. All this to simply say that this is our time to shine. If it were ever a good time to, to be a Christian and be so boldly in the way you live your life, it, at that time is now. To be a light to your neighbor, to be merciful, forgiving, friendly, um, and kind, and to have eyes to see the needs of those who are suffering. And in fact, even when we're suffering, maybe you're even sick right now or you're feeling scared, one of the best things you can do is to, is to love your neighbor. In fact, I would just say that the best way to get your mind off of all this stuff that's stressing us out and making us feel bored or frustrated or, or scared about the future is in, instead to stop focusing on that and look at how can I help someone. One of the best ways to get your mind all of this is to help someone, is to reach out to someone. And although we probably shouldn't be visiting people, there are things that we can do to have eyes to see of ways that we can support, help, and love our neighbor in this difficult time. And I, I'm just so proud of you. You are that type of a person. You're not the type of person to be scared or worried. You are a relaxed, joyful person, overflowing with love and compassion. Don't let the news and all of these things keep you from being creative in the way that you're able to help your neighbor while still being responsible. I know you're going to continue to bless your neighbor and reach out to them and help them in this difficult time. Today, I'm going to tell you the parable of the Good Samaritan. Well, Jesus is going to tell the parable of the Good Samaritan, and I'm going to assist him. But uh, we're going to talk about this parable. Before we get into it, we have to understand the Jewish idea of parable. A parable, I do not believe that Jesus told parables to confuse people. It's easy in the modern era when we read the Bible in English to read a parable when Jesus says, you know, so that they, they, you know, their eyes would be closed or the ears would be closed and think he's trying to confuse them or he's trying to curse them. But that's not at all how a first century Jewish person would have heard what Rabbi Jesus was saying. In Judaism, parables were used to clarify 
an idea. Of course they would. It's a great teaching element. The parable of the Good Samaritan doesn't confuse us. It helps us be a more generous, loving, and kind person to our neighbor. And that's what Jesus intended the parable to do. You know, in those days, there was this expression that's, that if a rabbi told you a parable or a teaching and you answered that teaching correctly as a student, he would look at you and he would say, you have heard and you have heard. You have seen and you have seen. What does that mean? Well, sometimes people hear us and then other times they really hear us. Sometimes people see what we're saying and then they see what they're saying. Does that make sense? Uh, if it doesn't, one example that a rabbi used, I heard, was the story of Nathan and David. Remember when David uh, kills Bathsheba's husband by putting her at the front of an army line and ends up taking her as a wife, and the prophet Nathan confronts King David, and he comes before him and tells him this parable about this wicked, rich neighbor who stole the one lamb of the other neighbor and killed it as a hospitality gift. And remember what David said? He said, this man shall die. The rabbis say that David heard, but he didn't hear. He saw, but he didn't see. And then when Nathan said, that person is you, then David heard, and he heard, and he saw, and he has seen. How many of you have a husband or a spouse that sometimes when you talk to them, they hear, but they don't hear? They see, but they don't see. You have a kid, and you're trying to teach your child or your grandchild, or you're mentoring somebody, and you're like, you've heard, but you haven't heard. You've seen, but you haven't seen. And this is what Jesus is saying, that they would hear and not hear. They would see and not see. He's saying that they, they hear what he's saying, but they're not taking it to heart. They're not, they're not owning it. They're not making it theirs. They're not obeying with all their heart and all their soul and all their might and all their strength. And this is what Jesus is attempting to do, is, is to take them from just hearing. He wants them to hear that they would hear and see that they have seen. And that's his attempt. Now, before we get too far into this, Jews are way more comfortable with the hierarchy of goodness than we modern Christians are. We like to say, oh, all sin is all sin, which, by the way, isn't in the Bible. Um, but I'm, I'm not going to go too, too much into that. But all sin does separate us from God, but it's not all the same. And in, in, in Jesus' day, they wanted to sort of rank commands. So there were kind of seven or eight schools, depending on the time period, of Pharisees, rabbis, and teachers, and they love to wrestle with this question, how do you inherit eternal life? That is, how do you live the right kind of life that's overflowing with goodness and shalom and, and, and all, of the, all of these things? And every rabbi answered this question, the first answer to the question the same way. They would say, number one, it's Shema. Remember Shema from a couple weeks ago? Shema, you shall love the Lord with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength. That's number one. And every rabbi, every Pharisee, everyone agreed on this. But number two, what's number two? Well, this is where they diverged. Some would say number two is honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. And now I would say, like, imagine in this group of Pharisees and theologians and teachers that are wrestling with these, there's sort of a strict group, you know, and then there's the more gracious group. And on the, on the most strictest side, they would say the second thing is honor the Sabbath. And then they would say, maybe third or fourth is love your neighbor as yourself, or love your neighbor. Uh, this is from Leviticus, by the way. Jesus doesn't make this up. It's something that rabbis say. But there was another group, a more gracious group, that would say, number one is love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength. And number two is love your neighbor as yourself. Now, I can see I'm losing everybody. This is good. But catch me here, okay? This is a normal response. Number two is love your neighbor as yourself. Then they would say, well, who's my neighbor? And the most gracious group would say, you know, is, is my fellow Jew, religious Jew, my neighbor? Yes, absolutely. What about my fellow Jew who's not religious? Some would say no. Some would say yes. The gracious group would say, yes, your fellow non-religious Jew is your neighbor. And then some would say, well, what about the Gentile that's a man of God? Yes, that's your neighbor. And what about this person? Yes. This person? Yes. And the most gracious school would say, yes, 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 yes. Until you said, what about the Samaritan? Even Hallel the most gracious, kind of free, you know, hippie 
like really loving rabbi was like, no, not the Samaritan. Nobody in Jesus' day believed of everybody that the Samaritan could be a neighbor. They were the worst of the worst. Who were these Samaritan guys? Well, 70, uh, 722 BC, the northern kingdom of Israel was conquered by the Assyrians, who were the most evil, bloodthirsty group ever. And out of that came a region that was called Samaria. Samaria was full of, obviously, Samaritans who were viewed by Jews as half-breeds. They were mudbloods. They were this like weird mix of Jews and Assyrians. And this created a sort of a type of racist uh, thing towards their neighbor where they just, these groups just started hating each other and they called, them, called each other vile names and the, each group said that the other was disgusting. And you talk about a neighbor, they're right, they're literally next to each other, right next to each other. There's all sorts of examples that, you know, fueled this fire. But for example, the, the Jews, a hundred years before Jesus, destroyed the holy temple of the Samaritans on Mount Gerizim. The Samaritans, in turn, went to the holy temple in the middle of the night and littered the Holy of Holies with dead corpses in order to defile the temple so it couldn't be used. And they just continued to sow bitterness and hatred towards one, one another until they became the ultimate rivals. You know, the Montagues and the Capulets, the the sharks and the jets, you know? It's, this, was, this was them, you know? It was this, this deep, deep hatred where they would say, literally everyone is a child of God. Every single person is a child of God and is my neighbor and needs to be treated with dignity, except Samaritans. They're demons. They're horrible. We got it? Yes. Luke 10, chapter 30. Jesus is uh, teaching, and a theologian comes to Jesus to test him. Now, to test him is a compliment. You don't test people you dislike. You test someone that you're thinking of becoming a disciple to. You want to understand more. It's an honor to be tested by a theologian. Okay, this is not a bad guy. And this theologian who clearly loves what Jesus is saying and clearly is interested in following him says to Jesus, Rabbi, how might I inherit eternal life? Remember, that question has been debated a lot. Jesus says, what is written in the law? How do you see it? And the theologian answers from the gracious party, right? The loving party, the group that's, that's, that's the most tenderhearted. And he says to Jesus, love the Lord. And this is how he would say it. You, you, you don't say the Shema half-heartedly. You say, you shall love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. When he says mind, he's quoting Jesus, by the way. He's actually saying, I've, I've been listening to what you're saying. And number two, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Okay? Then Jesus says, you have answered correctly. Do this and you shall live. Right? You think, that, you think it's over. And then he's kind of like, kind of like thinking about, like, and it says because he wanted to justify himself, he looked at Jesus and he said, well, who's my neighbor? And of course, Jesus, being a rabbi, responds with a parable. He says there was a man that was traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. By the way, this is a famous road called the Jericho Road. It's a very treacherous, uh, very treacherous, uh, th thin road that goes from Jerusalem, obviously, to Jericho. At some points, it's only 18 inches wide. Sometimes it's 200, 300 feet in the, in the air. I don't know if you can see it. But this is a road right here. Look, this is it right here. You see a little donkey? This is the road. You take a slip and you're going to fall into the Grand Canyon here. Not really the Grand Canyon. It's, it's Jerusalem. It's Israel. But, but uh, yeah, so, so he says traveling on this road. So there's no way that the people traveling by would have missed the man. They're going to have to, in an effort, get around him. And he says that he was robbed and beaten, that he was stripped naked, that he was given wounds, he was bleeding and that everything was taken from him. And it, says that, and it says that he was half dead. Now this term half dead is important. Uh, half dead, it kind of reminds me of Billy Crystal from Princess Bride when he's like, he's not dead, he's mostly dead. You know, like he looks dead, he's white, he's pale, he's stiff, but he's still alive. And so there was a term for, the, for this, that he was half dead, meaning that 
all accounts, he, yes, he was technically alive, but he looked like he was probably dead. Plus, he was cut, so he was unclean. And it says first that a priest came by and walked around him. Now, here's what I want you to see. In the Jewish mind, what the priest was doing was not an evil or bad thing. In, in Levitical law, the priests and the Levites are not allowed to touch anything unclean, which include, includes any, anyone or anything that is bleeding or any dead, uh, dead person. They're not allowed to touch them. And so what the Jewish person would have heard was, oh, that poor Levite who would have wanted to help his fellow Jew couldn't because he would become ceremonially unclean. So the heart of the listener actually would have gone out to the Levite. I think that's something that we miss. The Levite and the priest, they're walking around out of a sense of duty to Torah more than out of a sense of like, oh, I don't want to mess with that. So they're doing, in other words, they're, they're not, they are putting honor the Sabbath, honor these rules and regulations over love your neighbor as yourself. They had to make a decision. And that was the decision they made. Keep in mind, the Samaritans also have a Torah, and the Samaritans also have these rules. In other words, the Samaritan, according to the Samaritan religion, because the man is bleeding, is also obliged, because he's dead, is also obliged not to touch the man. He has the same religious rule. So a priest goes by, a Levite goes by, and then Jesus says, and then... Uh, he's ta- remember, he's talking to this theologian who hates Samaritans. And he says, then a Samaritan comes. Samaritan comes on his, you know, through the desert and comes along and runs into this man. Sees him lying on the road. And the Bible says that he has pity on him. He sees him there bleeding. And he bandages his wounds. He puts oil and wine on the wounds, which is expensive. He puts the guy on his donkey and carries him to the nearest inn. You know how far the nearest inn was back then? 12 miles. He had to go 12 miles on the Jericho Road. That's easily a day and a half travel to go, you know, to skip whatever appointment he was supposed to have to bring this guy, uh, to bring this guy to an inn. And when he gets there, he tells the innkeeper, take care of this man. He gave him a couple bits of silver and said, when he gets better, you know, just keep taking care of him. I'll come back and I'll pay whatever bill, you know, is there. And then Jesus looks at this theologian, this Jewish theologian, and he asks him the question, who was the neighbor to the man? Was he the priest? Was he the religious guy? Was he the guy that honored the Torah? Or was he the Samaritan? And the theologian can't even bring himself to say Samaritan. He just looks at Jesus, probably ashamed, and says, the one who had mercy on him. Interesting. I, I love this story, and I, th- I, think it's just, I think it's just so important. Jesus tells him, go and do likewise. Now, to go and do likewise doesn't mean, we always read the Good Samaritan as a story about helping people on the side of the road, and it is that. But really, it's a story about loving your enemies, It's a story about loving someone you think is subhuman, loving someone that you can't stand, loving someone that you think is against all you believe in. And you might even be right, but you still love them. I'm looking at you, political people. I'm looking at you, religious people. I'm looking at you who struggle with that neighbor who always leaves their trash out on the thing or those people who, you know, have hurt you in the past. And there is a calling from God. We we should have boundaries. We should be wise. But there is a calling from God to nurture love in our hearts for those who feel unlovable. And I think the most important thing to pull from this is not that it's just the enemies, but it's just kind of everybody. That you're, it's your near dweller. Remember, Jesus never tells us to love the whole world. Jesus tells us to love our neighbor. That's the person near you. And sometimes a person near you that you're supposed to love is somebody that's really fun to love. If I see a puppy on the side of the road with a thorn in his paw, I'm like, oh, I'm going to help my neighbor, you know, and that's fun. <laughs> but if I see someone, you know, that needs help for me, and this is someone who insulted me recently, or, or, or someone who is, who is against us, or someone who, 
you know, has lied about me, it becomes harder to be a loving person towards them. But during these times, it's the time when we love our neighbor the most. I just want to say, that is who you are. You're not a vindictive, angry, bitter person. You are a loving person. And the love and the compassion and the joy that you bring to your neighbor means so much to them. You're a loving person to your spouse. You're a loving person to your kids. You're a loving person to the the person at the checkout stand or to the people that are helping you. And it's going to be really easy during these times of stress and fear and financial crunches to be short with people or to yell with people or to feel like others are taking advantage of you. Sometimes people will cut in front of the line in front of you or take your bread or, you know. I heard one story that at Costco, two people were reaching for the last bit of egos. And it was a young guy with his teenagers and another lady. And the guy looks at this lady and he literally says, Lego my ego. That, that, that somebody actually observed that. It was a, it was a sweet line, but, but that's, that that's going to be the temptation. But now more than ever, I feel like acts of compassion and love strike harder and deeper than they normally would. Like right now, when most people are acting scared or pausing or freezing... You know, doing something kind or loving to your neighbor is going to strike deeper and mean more than it normally would. In other words, it's an opportunity to show your neighbor how loved they are. The people that receive the least amount of love, I think, are the ones that say and do the least. The ones that are hidden. The ones that are not obviously, you're not able to see them. The ones that are not going to get mad at you if you don't do something nice. And and that's the great opportunity is to notice people that are in isolation or that are feeling lonely or need help, and you can do that um, for your neighbor. So I think that this is a time when I look around and I think these, there's not going to be people, hopefully, bleeding on the side of the street as you're driving around as little as you do, but there are people who really are in need. The elderly and shut-ins not only need help getting the supplies that they, that they need, but they're also going to feel lonely. Heck, I feel lonely. I feel bored. And so many people, many people that you love that can get out are feeling stressed about their jobs and feeling alone or feeling like maybe people don't love them. And, and there's also going to be a huge financial need, especially for 1099 employees. That is anybody who's in hospitality or servers at restaurants, people who are in entertainment, you know, people who are uh, professional musicians and actors and things that a lot of their gigs are getting canceled. And these are problems that the church can't completely, completely solve, but they're, they're problems that you can help with. And if we all help with, we can make a difference. I think that all of us can practice digital kindness, which is as simple as checking in. Hey, how are you doing? Or, hey, I'm praying for you today. Or, hey, I just want you to know, you know, I love you and I, I miss you. And I can't wait till this is all over so we can hang out to, to, with each other. Even sending funny memes which I do with my sister and brother-in-law all the time, is a way of being loving. It's a way of saying, you know, keeping it lighthearted and saying, hey, I'm thinking about you. I think just the main thing is just that we become those that have eyes to see the needs of those around us. That we have eyes to see. That we're not so focused on ourselves that that we don't take pity on those who need to be seen. There are a lot of people that will be near dwellers to you who are going to be invisible unless you see them. And I'm really imploring you because I think you're the type of person that can make the biggest difference in their life to remind them how needed they are, how loved they are, how this is all going to be over very soon, how, you know, how if they need anything, you're happy to help them. And just those, even if you don't end up doing anything, just the words themselves can be a salve to the soul. And I'm so grateful for people like you because you really do have eyes to see you know, when Jesus is in the Sermon on the Mount, let me ask you a question. If, I, if a pastor gets up and says, who is the light of the world? Let me ask the choir, who's the light of the world? Oh, it's a mix. See, the, the gut response, if I ask this in a Sunday school class, I ask a bunch of kids, who's the light of the world? All the kids are going to say, Jesus. And they're right, they're right. But, but Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount does not say, I am the light of the world. He says, you are the light of the world. You are. You are the light of the world. It almost sounds like a heresy. It's not. It's the words of Jesus Christ. 
You are the light of the world. If you want more light in the world, if you want things to brighten up, if you want things to feel better, be you. Be you. Be a loving, kind, sweet, generous, friendly, enthusiastic sometimes person. <laughs> Not all of us are enthusiastic, and that's okay. But, I, but be you. Be you. Full of life. Overflowing with, with mercy and joy and friendliness. And watch how that makes all the difference. There. There's going to be people who after this is over, they're going to be like, I am so glad for people like you. Without people like you, I wouldn't have gotten through this. Thank you. And, uh, and I think that that's great. So keep being that person. I know a lot of us feel stressed and worried, but we're going to trust the Lord and continue to not worry as much about ourselves and continue to bless our neighbor and make sure that we all help each other through this. And we will. Everything will be just fine. So Father, we thank you and we love you that you loved us first. And so one of the greatest responses of faith we can have is to have eyes to see those who are invisible. Eyes to see ways that we can love our enemy and love our near dweller and love people that otherwise would be unwanted or forgotten. Thank you for the people who are under the sound of my voice who are, who are the light, lights of the world and each one of them makes the world brighter and we're so thankful for that. Lord, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. you, especially to those of you, if you made a gift to the church today, it really means a lot and it helps us a lot get through this difficult time. Thank you for joining us. Uh, join us next week live at 945 and, we're, and we'll just keep doing this as long as we got to do it because we love you and we're, we think this is a great thing. So now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The preceding program was paid for by the ministry partners of the Hour of Power and viewers like you and is accredited by the Evangelical Council for Financial Accountability.